Welcome back to the Science of Photography. Today's episode is about getting those perfect pinhole exposures. Now there are two major concerns when it comes to pinhole photography. One is, how do we meter for such large F numbers, such small openings with our little pinholes? And the second problem is, with such long exposure times that are associated with pinhole photography, how do we go about calculating reciprocity for those shutter speeds? If you've been following this channel, we've been talking a lot about pinhole photography. In fact, in previous videos, I've showed you how to make an eight x 10 pinhole camera, but these plans can be adapted for any camera that takes a film back, such as eight x 10, five x seven, and four x five. Or maybe you have your own pinhole camera and you're curious about how to expose film for those perfect exposures. One of the biggest challenges with metering for pinhole cameras is that most meters actually don't reach the extremely high F numbers that the pinhole cameras generally have. So how do you meter a scene so that you get that perfect exposure? Now, if you're a fan of this channel, you know the answer to this question is gonna involve some math, but don't worry, it's actually very simple and you really only have to do the calculation one time to set up your pinhole camera. And then when you go out and meter, all you have to do is do a simple calculation to find out your proper shutter speed. So I won't go into the nitty gritty and derive the formula, but let's just go over it. So essentially what we're going to do is you have to know the F number or the aperture of your camera. So for the camera that I built, I'm gonna use my eight by 10 as an example. And this is an exercise you're gonna to have to do for each of your pinhole cameras because they're all different. Now, what we have to do to find an F number is simply take the focal length F and divide it by D, the diameter of the opening. In this case, it's our pinhole diameter. So my camera that I built has an 80 millimeter focal length and has a 0.3 millimeter diameter pinhole, which means that its F number is 266.6 repeating. So we're gonna round this to, we're gonna call this 267. So now we have the F number of our camera. And then what we have to do is we have to look at the relationship between the F number of the camera and the F number where we meter the scene and then apply a factor to the shutter speed measured at the metered reading to get our new shutter speed. So all this looks like, and if you want a derivation of this calculation, I can go into it in another video, but I know some of the math, uh, people like to gloss over the math. So I'm just gonna give you the formula and we're gonna learn how to apply it in this episode. So take, let's take a look. So we'll take the F number of our camera. Here I'm gonna call it F prime. We're gonna divide it by F, which is the F number of what we're setting our meter to. We're taking this entire quantity and squaring it. And then we're gonna multiply that by the time where we read this F number. And that's gonna give us T prime, our new shutter speed. Let me give you an example to make this more concrete. Like I said before, F prime, the number, the F stop of our pinhole camera is gonna be 267. Let's just say I choose F16 at what I'm going to set my meter at. So we put 16 in the denominator. We're gonna square this quantity. We're gonna multiply it by our shutter speed and that gives us our new shutter speed. Now notice that ISO doesn't even factor into this equation. We're gonna talk about where it comes in later, but you don't need to know anything about ISO or anything. This is just a property of your camera and the property of what you set your meter to. So this quantity right here is not going to change as long as you keep, as long as you're using the same camera as before with the f-stop that you know, and you set your meter to f16. So what does this quantity calculate to? So we can just put this in our calculator and we find out that this quantity is equal to, and I have it written down, it's about 278, 0.5, roughly speaking. So that means we take this number, all we do is multiply that by the shutter speed that our meter says at F16. So if our shutter said one second at F16 was the correct exposure for the scene, we just multiply it by this, so it'd be 278.5 seconds would be our shutter speed, which is very long shutter speed, but that's just an example. If it has a more reasonable shutter speed, like one over 25, well then it's just gonna be this times one over 25. Now, if you don't want to use F16, you can use anything else. For example, if we used F128, we'll get a smaller number here, so the numbers might be more manageable for some mental math. So we'll do 267 over 128 squared, and that quantity, as long as we meter at 128, it's going to be equal to 4.35. 
Now, as long as we meter at 128, all we have to do is multiply by 4.35, or you know, if you're guesstimating in the field, maybe between four and five seconds uh, times whatever time the shutter speed is. So it might be easier for some mental math once you memorize this number. So that, of course, begs the question, why would you choose one f-stop to meter at versus another? Why would you choose to meter at f-16 or meter at 128? And that has more to do with your meter. So let's talk about meters. So there are lots of different meters that you can use in your photography. One could be your phone. Maybe you have an app on your phone that has a meter function that you could use. You could use a digital camera that you bring along with the scene so that you can use the digital camera, meter the scene using the internal camera meter, and then apply that to the math and the board and your pinhole camera. Maybe you have like this tiny Sekonic uh, incident light meter like this one. Um, but I think most film photographers, and if you're serious about film photography, will eventually invest in a spot meter uh, like this one or like this one. So what these meters do is you actually look through and uh, it's a one degree spot meter. So the, the, there's a little spot in the middle and I'm targeting a neutral gray to get an overall scene or maybe I'll look in the shadows, I'll meter the shadows and I'll meter the highlights and I'll find some in-between values. So spot meters are really going to be uh, your best friend when it comes to film photography. Not that the other methods are bad, use what you have, but I always find that a dedicated meter, that's especially, especially a spot meter, is always gonna be more, it's always gonna be more accurate than uh, an incident meter or the, the meter on the app on your phone or even a digital camera. So let's run through an example and then I'll show you what that looks like on different meters. So, we have our factors here. Let's just remember those. I'm gonna erase this. And let's say we meter a scene and we decide that middle gray is going to be an exposure value of 10. You don't need to know that. It's just, you know, if you have experience with meters, you kind of know what I'm talking about. If you're using a digital camera where it shows you just a little like bars back and forth, how much you're over and underexposed, it's not gonna give you an actual exposure value. But for the example, I'm just gonna use EV10. So let's take a meter reading. Let's say our film is Ilford Delta 100. So it's an ISO 100 film. So we set our meter ISO value to 100. That's important. That's where the ISO comes in. We have to meter at the ISO of the film that we're using. So we're using Delta 100 meter, set the meter to ISO 100. We take a reading, we get EV10. We look at the meter and we see that at F16, it tells us a shutter speed of one fourth of a second. So now remember that for the F16 factor that we looked at before, that was that, what was it, 278.5 number, which gives us a new exposure time for our pinhole camera, which was at 267, to be 69 seconds. Nice. So, how do we use a different calculation where we metered at, let's say that 128. Remember our factor there was uh, gonna be 4.35. And here the meter is gonna say something like 15 seconds. And that gives us 65, 65 seconds roughly. Now these numbers, they should be equal, but they're not gonna be exactly equal. And the reason for that is there's a couple of stops between F16 and 128. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six stops down our F stop scale. And if we do, if we double this number six times, it goes from a fourth to a half to one to two to four to eight to 16. So really the meter says it's 15 seconds, but if you did straight math, it would tell you 16 seconds. If you did 16 times this, you'd get that same 69 seconds. In the long run, this isn't gonna matter. Um, the difference of four seconds when it comes to a 60 second exposure isn't going to be that much of a difference. So again, pick which number you're comfortable with and just use that factor throughout. But again, we have to ask the question of why would you calibrate your pinhole camera factor, one of these numbers, to either an F16 metering or an F128 metering. And that's really gonna depend on the meter that you're using or what's available to you. So let's look at the B camera and we'll go over some meter options. All right, so we're here and we have a digital camera. And uh, basically, you're gonna, if you're using a digital camera to meter, uh, which again, use what you have, but if you have a digital camera lying around, you may only have a lens that can stop down or a camera that can stop down meter towards the maximum aperture of the lens. So let's say that this lens only goes to F16. If it 
doesn't go past f16, the automatic metering of the camera is not going to be able to give you a reading for shutter speed based off of anything higher than that. So we can't use that 128 number when it comes to a digital camera. So we're going to have to use the f16 factor. If we use something like this Sekonic meter here, let's just turn this on. You can see here that we have a meter reading at f16 of 60, 1 60th of a second. This is different from our example, but just to give you an idea. Now, if we start going and changing the F number of this meter, let's say we want to try that 128, right? So we go to 22, 32, 45, 64, 90, and oops, there it goes. We have an error message, essentially saying that this meter cannot give us a number for F128. Um, so we can keep going and there's no data here. So unfortunately, this meter, its limitation would be uh, the shutter speed at an f-stop of 90. So maybe we consider using 90 as our factor, and we have to recalculate that factor for f90. But we can also you know, use this for our f16, because we've already calculated the f16. Now, here's why I think uh, spot meters are the best, because they essentially give you uh, in, my, in my experience, they've given you the biggest range when it comes to metering. So again, in this spot meter, uh, basically it's all controlled within this dial. So we use this inner dial to set the ISO value to our film speed of 100. And then we simply rotate this to give us that EV value at our middle value of, in this case, it's zone 5. So here we have it set at 10, and we notice here at F16, there's our quarter of a second. And then this meter goes all the way up to 128, so we can use that 15 seconds here. So this meter has the capability to go to F128, or any of the numbers that you see on here. So you can pick any number to make your factor, just be consistent. This other spot meter works very much the same way. Again, here we have exposure value of 10. We're set to an ISO of 100. We look over here at this side, we see F16 and a fourth of a second. We can then use reciprocity to come over to 128, a fifth, you know, 15 seconds. Again, this meter goes up to F128, but it's still not, it's still not gonna reach our 267 or anything close to that. So that's why we have to use these factors. So really the key is consistency. If you know what you're going to be using to meter the scene, whether it be your phone, digital camera, or a dedicated light meter, you have to know the limitations of that light meter. And you have to pick a f-stop that that light meter can measure so that you can use a factor out in the field. So for the digital camera, maybe you want to choose f-16. For a spot meter, maybe you want to choose the highest setting of f-128 because that makes the mental math a little bit easier because it's going to be a smaller factor that you have to multiply the shutter speed by. Whatever you do, use the same meter and use the same factor and meter everything in a similar fashion to eliminate that variable of the equation. And then if your film doesn't come out the way you want, as long as you keep your metering the same, then you can change other dimensions, whether it's shutter speed, whether it's development times, but just pick a meter that you have, whatever's available to you, use it, learn it, and then you can think about changing things on the metering side if you upgrade to a better meter or anything like that. But the key is keep one thing consistent and then start changing other variables before you start changing that initial factor, which is so important. Okay, so we have our metering down. For example, the F16 metering at 1 4th, we use our F16 factor, we get 69 seconds. That's what I'm gonna use for my shutter speed. But there's also something we have to consider, which is reciprocity, specifically reciprocity failure. So reciprocity basically means that Let's say at f16 at one second, if I stop down, I close half the amount of light, reciprocity says that I have to use double the exposure time. So if I have one second here and I stop down on my camera, I have to use two seconds here to get the same exposure. Likewise, I stop down again, I have to double the light because I'm having the amount of light that comes in, I have to double the time the light enters the camera. So this would be four seconds and eight seconds. So that's what reciprocity means. Reciprocity means that at, at, at two different pairs of shutter speeds and uh, F numbers have the same equivalent exposure value. Now, unfortunately, the medium that we use for pinhole photography in this case is going to be film. Now, even though that mathematics says that we have reciprocity between all these different things as long as we keep doubling the amount of light, film is an organic compound. And essentially, as light 
hits film, it becomes less and less sensitive to light over time. So the longer shutter speeds actually don't give you the same equivalent exposure because the film loses its sensitivity the more you hit it with light. So this is what we refer to as a reciprocity failure. When the actual shutter speed doesn't match what reciprocity would tell you would be appropriate for whatever f-stop that you're using. And it's during that failure we have to add some compensation. We have to actually add more time in order to overcome that degradation of the film's ability to capture light. So where does that leave us? Well, you either have to test the film that you're using, which can be a long and tedious and expensive process, or you're at the mercy of the manufacturer that hopefully they've published their film's reciprocity characteristics, or maybe you're lucky enough that someone's already done these tests and have published their results online on some photo forum. So you can type in whatever film you have, reciprocity characteristics, and read through you know, hundreds and hundreds of threads of people arguing about reciprocity characteristics of their film. So again, you know, taking someone else's word for it, or even the manufacturer's word for it, is not gonna be a substitute for your own testing, but at least it's gonna be a good starting point. So using our Ilford Delta 100 example before, and we're gonna use this F16 number, because I think that applies to most people who have any light meter can probably use the F16 factor for their camera. Luckily, Ilford has put out technical bulletins that have film reciprocity failure compensation. So this is the advantage of going with a well-reputable film source. Ilford, uh, I think, is the leader in black and white film, bar none. Uh, and they have here, for most of their black and white films, they have a factor for Ilford Films of what the factor is for reciprocity characteristics. So I look at this table, and uh, I'll put a blow up of this on the screen, and we can see that for Delta 100, the factor is 1.26. So we call this, uh, let's call this RF. For reciprocity factor is 1.26. Uh, now, this, unfortunately, you're going to have to do on the fly because it's going to depend on the time. Uh, because what happens is the way you use a reciprocity factor is you take your T prime, remember that's our new shutter speed after we account for this factor, and we have to basically raise that to the power of our RF, our reciprocity factor. So for example, what used to be a 69 second exposure is actually going to be 69 to the 1.26 power, which you'll have to do in your calculator, and I have it written down here, it's actually a 209 second exposure. So you can see how even just, you know, going for more than a second leads into some very large uh, actual shutter speeds. And generally what film manufacturers say is that everything up to one second or even a couple seconds is probably okay without reciprocity. But after you get in those over one second shutter speeds, five seconds, 10 seconds, in this case, 69 seconds, there's a lot of degradation that goes on. Things are less sensitive to light as they get exposed to light and you're gonna have to really overcompensate for that. So this would end up being a 209 second total exposure. So let's go over one more example just to drive the point home. So let's say instead of Ilford Delta 100, I'm gonna be using HP5 Plus, which is an ISO 400 film. So now remember, my factor isn't going to change because the factor is independent of ISO. What is gonna change is what the meter reading is because if I'm at F16, it's no longer gonna be a fourth of a second because my film speed is faster. So if I have, I have to put in my meter, it's still F16, but I have to make sure I change that ISO value to 400. If I do that, I'm gonna get 1 15th of a second. And instead of 69 seconds, we are now at, what do we add here? 18.56, which makes sense because it was about 70 seconds before, 69 seconds. We have that, that's about 35, have that again, it's close to this, right? So it's, it's along the lines of two stops difference between the old and the new. So now we have our 18.65, but again, we have to apply that reciprocity factor and the RF for this film is gonna be different than before. So I look at my table, I see that it's 1.31. So now we're gonna take 18.56 raised to the 1.31 power, and that's gonna give me 45.92 seconds. So 45 seconds instead of 209 seconds. 
So you can see how using a faster film might be advantageous if you don't want to sit around forever and uh, wait for your film to be exposed. So bringing it all back to why we're here, getting that perfect pinhole exposure for our film, what do we do? Well, the way I do it is I write down in a notebook or I can even write it down on the camera, but I use a couple different films, so I usually keep just a notebook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick my f-stop, right? So here's, here's what we're trying to get at. In a notebook or on the camera or in a piece of paper that you can tape to the camera, you want the following table. So we start with what film that we use. So I typically use, the, use those two films that I had in the example. So we'll just put Delta 100 and HP 5 Plus in one row. Then we're gonna say, just so we don't forget what our ISO value is, because it's important we have to meter at that ISO value. Delta 100 is obviously 100, HP 5 is not as obvious, but it's a 400 speed film. Then we're gonna have our factor. So they can be, remember, whatever you want, just remember what f-stop you're metering at. So I denote that the Greek letter tau, which is t, time, time factor. And then I'll put a subscript, 16, so that I know I have to meter at f16. And that factor was that 278. Now it's gonna be 278 in all cases, so I might just merge those two columns and just say for everything use 278, because that's not gonna change based on the ISO value. The ISO value again is only gonna change what you meter at. So for example, Delta 100, set my meter to 100, meter at F16, apply this factor. And then after that, the last thing we have to do is our reciprocity factor, which is different between films. And again, Delta 100 is 1.26 and this is 1.31. So now I know with this small table, I have now exactly calculated what is going to happen with my exposure. I know I'm gonna meter an F16, set my ISO value into whatever film I'm using, take that shutter speed, multiply it by 278, take that answer, raise it to this power if it's over one second, which usually it will be for pinhole cameras, and that is my perfect exposure time. Now I know we had some math in this episode where we had to go through all the different calculations of how to do this, but that's what pinhole photography is all about. It's finding that exposure time for those super long exposures and using what we know about film reciprocity to make sure that we're not wasting film. We get usable exposures from our pinhole photographs. And essentially, once you do the calculation once for your camera, for your set of film that you use, maybe you only use one film, right? It's, it, you only have to do this calculation once and write this number down and then bring your phone has a calculator on it or bring a calculator with you out in the field and it's gonna be super easy once you put this into practice. So it's a little bit of work up front, just to make sure that all your bases are covered between your film and your camera, and you know, making sure that your meter has the ability to meter at whatever you choose your factor metering to be at. But once you do that, you're gonna have perfect exposures every time. Now, I'm not liable if you don't have perfect exposures because you might have messed something else up, and again, nothing is a good substitute for getting out and testing and testing and testing. There could be issues with development times and all kinds of other things. There's so many factors that go into making film photographs. It could be a lot of things, but hopefully this video helped you at least solve the mystery of how to get those perfect exposure times, or at least according to the manufacturer, what they call is perfect. But again, go out, take photographs, and test, test, test. So I hope this video was informative. I hope it helped you and inspire you to go out and make pinhole photographs. Hopefully made the process a little bit easier for everyone. And if you did enjoy the video, it'd mean a lot if you subscribed with notifications enabled hit a like, leave me a comment. I try and read all my comments, answer most of the questions that I get on the channel. So don't be afraid to reach out if you have any questions about any of this. Uh, and remember, Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day, although there's a lot of things going on in the world right now, it's still the last Sunday in April. So think about if you're gonna go out and shoot some pinhole photographs. And uh, yeah, until next time, happy photographing.